Hello World. I'm Robin Catling, and this is Write On. Join me in my author journey as I delve into the craft of writing, bringing you tools, tips, and lessons learned the hard way so you don't have to. The Author as Translator A revelation about my fantasy series. I'm the author as translator. Put another way, my characters don't speak English. My fantasy world is far from ours in time and space. The people there have many languages unknown to us. The horse clans, the Lacanai tribes, the Arianites. The common lingua franca for day-to-day conversation within Escalon is the low speech. It has various dialects, some of which are unintelligible to outsiders. Then there's the thieves' cant of the criminal underworld spoken by the coterie. The church and the aristos revert to the high speech. Why does it matter? Language hugely influences the vocabulary, idiom, tone and register of all the dialogue and interiority. When it comes to word choices, metaphors, similes, pop culture references, I have to decide, does it belong? Booktuber Jed Hearn recently surveyed his audience on the things they hate about the fantasy genre. Anachronistic language came out high on the list. Dialogue and description, 21st century earthlings take for granted, that just doesn't belong in the kingdom of Zarg. Preserved in amber. Language is the frontline casualty when reader expectations and genre conventions clash. High or epic fantasy typically features characters with no exposure to 21st century Earth culture. They have their own cultures, often highly detailed in lore and world building. Deliberate use of capital letters there. We can't all be Professor Tolkien, who spent decades as a scholar creating languages for Middle Earth. Even he had to translate Elvish back into English for the likes of you and me. I don't speak Elvish. Believe me, I tried. This is a problem for certain genres within fantasy more than others. Urban fantasy, say Dresden Files, and portal fantasy, Narnia, get to take characters and settings from our world as their start point. Language and culture come with them into the fantastical elements, often with intriguing or comical fish-out-of-water consequences. Side note, the Fremen of the desert world of Arrakis would never use the metaphor fish out of water. They have no fish, or water, but they do have sand trout. There's an equivalent saying in their culture. Great expectations. Classic fantasy is assumed to take place in a setting inspired by ancient antiquity, Persia, Greece, Rome, or else Iron Age Britain, medieval or Renaissance Europe. The current borrowing from pre-industrial China, Japan, Africa, or South America widens the genre considerably. Did any of these cultures speak modern English? No. None spoke the phrases "was up, swipe right, club sandwich, or rad. I doubt the pharaohs addressed each other as yo dude. So it upsets the readers and takes them out of the fantasy world when characters do just that. Shakespeare is often cited, wrongly, as the founder of modern English. His 400-year-old jokes are littered with classical and Elizabethan cultural references, as are Alexander Pope's notes from the Enlightenment a century later. Do you fully appreciate the social hierarchy and codes of behaviour in Pride and Prejudice? Collect a sticker as usual. What about the stylized and formal language of any of those writers within their milieu? They don't speak English as we know it today. Language and culture moves on and evolves. Meanwhile, our fantasy characters know nothing of them or us. They exist in their own time, place and culture. They speak their own languages. The author becomes their translator. So the next question is, what kind of language or idiom is appropriate? When readers meet characters. The current YA romanticy genre has a common narrative voice which sounds like a suburban LA teenager, regardless of the setting. This is deliberate. If today's authors wrote like Shakespeare or Pope, few YA readers would get to the end of page one. 
They want readily identifiable characters using everyday language. That includes teenage girls gushing about how hot is the next guy to enter the room. These authors know their audience. Readers who don't think very deeply about culture and probably can't spell anachronistic. This is okay. This is the market. Is it good writing? Maybe not. What do I know? It's not okay. Let's take OK or OK. Cited as the most commonly used word on the planet, where did it come from? The Choctaw word "oki," the satirical "all correct," an election catchphrase "old kinderhook." Yes, that one's a cultural classic. I can't tell. OK sounds contemporary, which is why none of my characters ever say OK. I'm old school British, so dude is a particular pet hate of mine. Rad belongs to 1980s skate dudes. Obviously, somebody studying an ancient parchment is never going to swipe right. The expression comes from the digital age of smartphones and touchscreens. That's going to jump right out at the reader. But how about doom scrolling? Wink, nudge, smiley face. It's a little on the nose. It might raise a smile, in which case it better be intentional. Back to the question then: appropriate language and idiom. Who gets to judge? Every single reader. Creative subtitles. So my job is to present the story in a language and idiom that fits the characters, setting, and genre. Everything has to filter through culture, law, environment, belief systems, and the available technology. Today we're so obsessed with machines and the media, much of our discourse drips with it. Ancient cultures obsessed over deities and spirituality. The British obsess over the weather, but that doesn't mean restricting myself to cod medieval, swearest thou thine oath varlet vocabulary. I find the creative subtitling of non-English TV and movies endlessly fascinating. Sometimes expressions are lost in translation, sometimes ingeniously heightened. Why shouldn't a teenage pharaoh greet his tutor with "Yo, dude, what's up, my mentor"? That might fit the character perfectly. Who's to say an equivalent bit of street slang didn't exist among the generations of workers at Giza, or along the watchtowers of Gondor, or the thieves' cant of the coterie? What's appropriate? You decide. I'm just the translator. That's all for this time. Thanks for stopping by. You can like and subscribe to the channel, or go to robincatling.info to check out the blog.